Hi, welcome uh, to another episode of Project Geo. This is actually a Project Geo special, and uh, tonight we're actually uh, doing the Exploring A Tour with uh, Paul Van Dinter. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, you got it right. Oh, awesome, awesome. And he's uh, he's dialing into Google Hangouts all the way from Australia. You can see he's got three different screens. Uh, uh, we also have Andrea Cariola, uh, another she's back from Project Geo as well. Uh, so. Uh, Paul's going to talk about a tour, what it is. Uh, we're going to dive deep into uh, everything you've done because it's a pretty impressive. Once uh, Google, when uh, Mickey Mellon released that post on Google Earth blog, uh, there was a, a lot of chatter about, um, "Hey, what is this awesome thing that this guy's working on?" So we're very interested in here. Uh, what do you have to say about it? How you did it, and, uh, and what your plans for the future are for it? So, Paul, do you want to do a brief introduction and uh, get started? Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, um, I need to go a little bit. So this is not Australia, but New Zealand. Um, Middle Earth. And um, it's exactly 12 o'clock uh, in the middle of the day here. Um, basically, um, I'm here in my, my office. Uh, Planet in Action is the website that I develop. And as a result of, of applications that I publish on the website, I get various clients come my way. Uh, one of the customers that came to me almost a year and a half ago was a Swedish museum and uh, they asked me to create an exhibit for them and um, after lots of talking backwards and forwards we ended up deciding okay we want kind of a digital diorama that will show basically their um, natural heritage area in Sweden you know in all its glory and um, well, basically, from there it got out of control, and it got bigger and bigger and more amazing all the way through. And uh, yeah, and at this point, I'm almost finished with the application and with with the whole system. And I thought it was a good time to uh, show it off to you. Oh, great! Awesome. Uh, so that's it sounds like you. Uh, so it's just not a hobby. You actually had a requirement to build this, right? Yes. Yes, I have a customer. Oh, sounds like we're having some audio issues. Can you hear us, Paul? You still there? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm here. I just touched my screen. I muted my microphone. Okay, so I need you to say that all over again. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you got cut off. <laughs> None of the work I do is a hobby. Uh, I get paid for pretty much all of my time. Um, although a lot of the stuff I do may seem like a hobby and that's actually the fun part of my, about my business and my job is uh, I get to play with technology I always say you know uh, my studio is a big man cave where I can basically create whatever I want and the same with the computer software so uh, I get the, I'm in this strange situation I come up with an idea I think oh this is cool let's see if I can do it and I'm quite happy to spend two three weeks building it and throw it out on planetinaction.com and um, one way or another, there's always somebody that needs something like that or a variation of it, and I get clients out of that, and uh, and that's how I get paid. And for the last four years, uh, it has been a continuous process of various projects I've been doing. So I'm uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to uh, to play with technology and get paid for it. Now having fun and working at the same time, right? Can't ask for anything more than that. <laughs> uh, no, there's actually getting out. So how about okay? So let's dive into. Uh, you got a couple other screens set up. Um, do you want to dive directly into uh, your interface there, or do you want to talk about what's on your uh, your desktop? I think it's best if I first go to the exhibit and uh, just uh, talk about a little bit, show a little bit of my footage. Uh, but of course, uh, the exhibit is uh, nine thousand seven hundred and twenty pixels wide and nineteen hundred and twenty pixels high. So there's no way that this video feed is going to convey what this thing can do. But at least I can talk about it a little bit there. No, great. Let's go. Okay, I'm off there. Okay, here I'm in the exhibit. This is ATOR. Um, I'm assuming you've got the right channel set up. Yep, uh, I got you uh, on the main screen right now. Okay, great. So, so what I'm standing in um, is, is a big uh, semicircular frame, which is 230 degrees, covered around. And uh, we've got 
nine screens put up. Each of these screens, they're all uh, 60 inch tall and, um, and arranged in a circle. So basically, from the center of the floor here, the perspective of all the screens is exactly right. Um, so what I've been doing is I've been generating software to create content for these screens that will play back on it. Um, you probably think this looks very similar to uh, the Google Earth Liquid Galaxy, um, which is part of the inspiration of doing it this way. The only big difference is uh, Liquid Galaxy is an interactive exhibit. Uh, every single screen on Liquid Galaxy is powered by a computer, uh, like a Windows computer, and each of the screens has a Google Earth application behind it. Uh, in this setup, we're not doing that at all, and the main reason is reliability. We don't like Google Earth crashing on uh, people in the museum, and if you've got nine Google Earths all working for one exhibit, one is bound to crash at some point. So we decided instead to go for video solutions. So I've written software that generates uh, video content on Google Earth Pro, which is then later processed in Adobe Premiere. And the video footage is then ch chopped up again and displayed on each of these screens. So when I take you around the back of the screens, um, I'll just turn on the video feed of my, uh, my phone. I'm not sure if that's working at the moment. Uh, what do you, are you trying to, okay, are you trying to switch the cameras or? Yes, yeah, so I just switched to the camera on my phone. You see a camera uh, footage with a little blue box in the center? Yep, I just changed it over. You're good. Okay, so we're just walking around the back of the screen. So what you can see here is that each of the screens is equipped with a little, uh, little computer. And the job of this computer is no other than playing back the video that's being generated with Google Earth Pro. And all of these things are synchronized through this hub here. And uh, the second computer is controlling the, uh, the input for these things. So we can go back to the eighth. Hey, Paul, all I'll ask is uh, just slow down a little bit when you walk so the, uh, the bandwidth and the internet has time to catch up with you. OK, all right. Well, uh, basically, uh, that blue box you saw uh, times nine. <laughs> Um, so what we've got here now is, is not just a big setup with nine screens. What we've got as well is, um, is quite a unique sound system. Uh, what we're looking at is uh, each of these displays, like uh, they actually converted TVs, they had their own two speakers anyway. And what I've done is uh, I've, taken, I've modified these screens and taken the speakers out. And there's a speaker underneath each of the screens. And there's a speaker above each of these screens as well. So that means that we've got 18 loudspeakers, uh, two circles of nine. So I have a low sound field right around the floor with the speakers projecting the sound down onto the floor and it bounces back up. And the location where the exhibit will be installed, the ceiling is about 2 meters 60, so slightly higher than this frame. And so the speakers at the top, the sound will bounce off the ceiling. So what we're able to achieve with that is, uh, is a bit more than Dolby surround sound. We actually can create sound fields and bring it down and lift it up, stuff that you can't do in a theater. Um, so in addition to those uh, 18 speakers, we have uh, two big PA speakers here to give the sound some body. And actually, uh, the most unique part about this exhibit is the loudspeaker I'm standing on. Um, this floor, there's a big circular floor that I'm standing on here that is almost uh, it's about nine feet in diameter. Um, it is suspended on rubber blocks, and it's, uh, it's powered by uh, uh, an LFE butt kicker, which is a, um, a speaker that rather than produce sound, it produces vibrations. Um, the speaker then is said uh, that the butt kicker is powered by a 2,000 watt amplifier, and this amplifier's only job is to induce vibrations into the floor. Now, the combination of the soundtrack, the 18 speakers around me, and the floor inducing vibrations in your body is absolutely spectacular because uh, you get this really powerful gut-wrenching sensation that you get, you know, at, at high-profile uh, rock concerts. But you get it without the decibels. So we have an exhibit that, that has a huge impact um, through sound and vision without producing the noise, so it won't disturb the rest of the museum. Um, so, so that is a combination of the things I have. Uh, one other thing to point out is just the floor itself. Um, we wanted to create a floor that actually represented the area of the, where the exhibit is taking place. And I'll just uh, turn on my camera again on my phone, and I will hold it still this time. 
And I just want to give you a little close-up. Okay, there we go. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. See. What we have is printed at 350 dpi. And um, the, uh, the satellite imagery has uh, been achieved, retrieved from, uh, from Sweden, where it's been produced. And, uh, you know, it's an absolutely incredible 18 gigabyte uh, image file that was used to produce the floor printing. What is so cool about the floor is, uh, I'll just turn off the camera, I'm back to the main camera. Uh, what is so cool about the floor is that when you're standing, you see all the colors and the bits and pieces going on. Uh, but the problem is you sort of look down and you go, oh, what's that city over there? And before you know it, you're actually on your knees crawling around, following roads and rivers and, and trying to figure out, uh, you know, what the lay of the land is. So even if you take this entire thing away with all its screens, the floor by itself is already pretty exciting. So to make sure that people see the floor, uh, the exhibit is equipped with, uh, with an array of LED spotlights, uh, which are also mounted underneath the screen. And um, after the show is finished, uh, the spotlights fade in, which is controlled by a little Arduino board, and um, just to make sure the audience can see the exhibit. So that is, uh, that is the technology that we're looking at here at the moment. Oh, great. So just to talk a little about the uh, sound system, what do you actually play for the, uh, uh, for the soundtrack when someone's going through the tour? What, what kind of things do you play? Okay, well, um, <laughs> that's actually a good question because uh, we're actually still working on the engineering for that. Um, it will be a lot of environment sound, so you might have seen a lot of my posts where I've been demonstrating 3D sound in Google Earth. Uh, so there will be a lot of that going on when, you, when you're flying past the waterfall, the sound of the waterfall will travel along. Uh, there will be high level environment sound like winds and uh, birds depending on where we're flying, whether we're low above trees or high in the mountains. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we're actually en engineering a purposely designed LFE soundtrack. Uh, which is going to induce vibrations into the platform, which will give you a flying sensation. So, uh, for example, um, you will be flying right across a cliff, and as you fly across the cliff, we just induce the right kind of vibrations that gives you this, this thundering feeling, you know, that there's something serious going on here. Or when we're flying along, there might be a, a mild vibration, and suddenly the vibration stops, and at the same time, the platform will be appearing, falling down into a valley. So we're going to be playing with the tactile feedback through the floor, which is going to be a, a handcrafted uh, sound wave that's actually created, you know, wave by wave with special software um, to, to induce exactly the right kind of vibrations into the floor to give you the sensation of that was a landing or, you know, we just hit the branches of a tree, things like that. Awesome. Uh, so is there any way, uh, so do you have, um, is it operational? Can you turn it on at all to... Uh Display some operation. Yes, uh, we've got the, this button here, which is uh, pretty crude. I haven't got the final button in place. And the idea in the exhibit is that the exhibit will play a segment of video. It will take off from a location, will fly somewhere else. As it lands, it will land inside um, a panoramic photo. And uh, inside, on top of the panoramic photo, we will have other slideshows playing and other pieces of video. And once the uh, the visitor is, is enough and decide they want to move on, they simply press the button again and the exhibit will fly to the next location and it will travel through about eight locations that way. So this is all test Hey Paul, you might have to uh, stand. You might have to. Um, you might have to get close to your microphone. Yeah, 
There we go. Okay. <coughs> it's all a bit of a mission um, to uh, to manage uh, all the sound channels and all the all the feeds we have. Uh, are you okay at the moment? Yeah, you know, it's perfect. I mean, I love to hear the soundtrack, but at the same time, I love to hear you talk about the product. At the same, so. Yeah, that was a bit of a, bit of a mission to, uh, to get that set up right. Uh, this is actually quite a pumping soundtrack on the background of this. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a Maori music. Uh, where we are is actually, this is Middle Earth. I mean, this is uh, the Southern Alps in the South Island of New Zealand. We're just flying into, um, we're just flown over Milford Sound, a very popular tourist destination. And this is basically a test render where uh, we've got nine video pieces of video footage joined together to create the, uh, the impression that we're flying through the mountains. And I just wish you could be here because the, uh, each of these screens are native 1080p resolution. So there's an incredible amount of detail in here. And as you can see, you know, these walls are big. I mean, there's an awful lot of pixels to look at at a very high quality. Um, so, so this is the kind of idea that uh, we're we'll taking a flying platform and we take the visitors around whatever area you wish and uh, we're hoping a lot more museums will want to make use of this system. What kind of... Uh, so uh, this is one way to use it. Yeah, go on. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, well, I was wondering, what kind of control does the user have? You were talking about eight different slideshows. Is there an eventuality where they can kind of choose from the planet, or does it have to be, well, based on the nature of adding the sound, and does it have to be very preset? It, it is very preset, and there's actually a couple of very good reasons for that. Um, I have actually been playing with the actual Google Liquid Galaxy, where you'd had a uh, space navigator control to fly through interactively. Uh, I've see, observed other people using it, and it's hilarious, because most people are not used to navigate in 3D space. That, that's a given. So what you get with this interactivity is that the, the user playing where they go, oh, cool, look at me shooting off into space and here and there. Within two seconds, they're lost. They've got no idea where they are anymore. And uh, the other people watching are probably so nauseous that they decide to skip lunch for that day. Um, so the idea of interactivity in an immersive environment like this is actually not such a great idea. Um, you may have read on my website about an application called G-Explorer, which is um, a navigation mechanism I designed to take cameras through space, which is what you're seeing here. Um, Google, uh, last year or two years ago, they purchased uh, the software from me and they made it open source, uh, so, which is nice because it means I can still use it. Um, the idea about that technology is that uh, it's a special way to move cameras through the 3D space without getting nauseous. So by pre-recording the path and predefining exactly where the user is going, they can stop worrying about navigating this thing and they can simply spend all of their time enjoying the view and they're guaranteed to get the best views you know, in the house. Um, it's very similar to when you go with a tour guide to go and view some monument or some museum. You know that you're going to hear the very best stuff there is to know about that location. Okay, that makes sense. No, awesome. So, so how many man hours do they take you to build this as it is right now? Um, I, I probably better not calculate the number of hours because I probably get depressed. This is one of these projects where, uh, where things have gone way out of control in terms of the amount of time I've been spending on it. Um, but I have been actually actively working on this pretty much every day for the last eight months or so. Are you documenting everything so that if, if other museums all of a sudden got real interested and obviously you can't build or mass produce these on your own, but if, I mean, are you documenting it so that um, uh, you, you were to, I'd say, sell the production of this to uh, uh, other, other museums on a, you know, uh, on a different level? Yeah, everything is documented. I mean, it's not just me being involved. I'm being the designer. I designed the frame and the solution and put things together pretty much all by myself because my background is uh, electric engineer, so I know a thing or two about that. Um, so what I've done is, um, you know, we've got all the engineering drawings, of course, and like, like I didn't weld the frame. There's an engineering firm uh, here in Auckland that produced it, and they could produce another hundred if that's what I wanted them to do. 
So, but I'm quite aware that we're far, far away from the US and to ship these things all the way across the ocean may not be the most economic way to do it. So I'm very interested to talk to other museums and other organizations that decide we need an exhibit like that because we can see how we can change the content over time. You know, it doesn't always have to be the same thing running. Um, so so um, even here locally, I've been able to produce quite a few more. This, this, this workshop is quite large. But at the same time, um, I'm very open to the idea to get other um, contractors involved in other countries to start building these things. Yeah, that's awesome. I'd love to see something in the Smithsonian here in D.C. just to go right in. Uh, I wish I had the money to go over there and visit New Zealand and check it out in person right now. So. Uh, yeah, it's actually so because the customer I have in Sweden, uh, there wasn't a plan at all for them to come over. We're doing everything through the Internet. And uh, it's only last week that I actually got an email and say, okay, I'm coming over. I don't want to wait anymore because this exhibit will be shipped in March to Sweden. And, um, and the project manager there, she just can't wait anymore. So she's coming to New Zealand um, just to check it out before it gets shipped over. So um, it got too much for her. Um, w w one advantage, by the way, of the video footage that I forgot to mention is, of course, um, everything is fully loaded 1080p top quality view. So there is no data that needs to be loaded. Like quite often when you look at a Google Earth tour, you fly through this blurry landscape because not all of the data is loaded. And if you're living in an area with very high quality bandwidth, I suppose it's not something you run into a lot. But I can tell you in New Zealand and certainly also in Sweden, at the location where this museum is, uh, there is internet, but the bandwidth is very limited. And so because of it, uh, they get to, um, you know, because of the video footage, everything is loaded, everything is stored, and so everything will be guaranteed in the very best quality possible. Okay. What I'm showing here, yeah, go no, on, go ask no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Uh, you're about to show something else. I, I want to let you continue. Yeah. Look, what I'm showing here is, uh, is GoPro footage. You might have read about the, uh, the GoPro, GoPro Hero 3 that's going to be out very soon. Yeah, the new um, camera, it's out right now over in stores here in the U.S. <laughs> uh, yeah, not quite here. I got them on order. And uh, the idea is that apart from doing Google Earth surround views, uh, we will be doing live views as well. And what you're seeing here is actually a video test. The big video in the center is, in fact, uh, a 1080p video that's scaled up 177%. And on the side, I'm running my videos at its native resolution uh, just to compare the quality differences. Um, Basically, what these tests are showing, particularly if I can run a GoPro at 2.7K resolution, is that um, a number of GoPros, modified GoPros with, with custom lenses, will be able to be used to create live surround video. So we can actually hang this thing under a helicopter and go and do this thing for real, which is something I hope to be doing this year as well, uh, next year. Um, when I just jump two scenes further, a couple of scenes. What you're seeing here is um, a tourism promotion video produced by Tourism New Zealand. This video is 4K resolution. So this thing, each pixel in the video is mapped to a pixel on the screen. And again, I cannot, I cannot possibly describe how absolutely mind-boggling and beautiful it is to watch a, uh, a 4K video on a digital screen. It is, uh, it is incredibly rich, and eventually what I, where I want to be is I want to be able to drive every individual pixel with live, real, high-quality video, broadcast-quality video, and create you know, absolutely mind-boggling presentations in this exhibit. Any hope to make it uh, 3D in the future? I, yes, actually working on that as well. I'm talking to a developer uh, in the South Island here in New Zealand. Uh, we're actually uh, looking at uh, building building a purpose-designed device uh, running an Android operating system or, or maybe Chrome OS operating system and we want to create a network 3D rendering engine so that you know we can actually start to play with live video, start to do live games on this thing as well. That's incredible. Uh, <laughs> you got so much there. It's, so I, I'm just thinking about the live, how you want to do a live video um, and going through this. And the first thought that came to mind is Google I.O. when uh, you had, uh, uh, what, not Larry Pate, but uh, Sergey's uh, friends who were jumping out of the blimp 
at Google I.O. down with their uh, Google Hangout, uh, their, their Google Glasses. And uh, the first thing I thought about is uh, I wonder how that video would look, you know, as, as, as they're doing that, jumping out of the blimp and uh, in A-Tour there. So. Yeah, that'd be pretty awesome. Well, in fact, if you look at this Hangout screen right now, you know, it wouldn't be awesome if all of these video streams would actually show up on all of these screens here and you'd be able to actually, uh, you know, see every person properly. And not only that, but have the voice of each person come from the appropriate screen as well. So you don't only see, but you hear the voice coming from the right direction as well. You know, there's, there's so much of things uh, that I would love to try with this exhibit. Um, I've been talking to a lady in uh, the Auckland War Memorial and Museum. They actually came around to have a look at this. And we were talking about presentations of uh, ancient war stories you know, where parts of the screen would be video, but there would also be people, you know, in the various screens standing there talking to you, and you have a person on your right and your left, and, you know, you feel really involved in, in what's going on. So there's a lot of crazy ideas uh, that, that have been sort of been generated, and I'm very keen to hear anybody else's ideas, you know, uh, how we can push this thing even further. No, that's great. I love your conference room idea. Uh, and so... How many weeks did you say you have until uh, this thing is delivered to Switzerland, you said? Uh, it's going to Sweden. Sweden, and, sorry, um, Sweden. Oh, I'm actually very fortunate because they can hang on to this, uh, this exhibit for quite a while longer because it will have to be shipped um, early March. The beginning of March is going to go into a container, uh, which means I've got a lot more time to refine this thing, to test new ideas and new content before it gets shipped away. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I want to let it go, actually, but uh, but I got a long time to play with it a bit more and try to market it more and get people in to look at this thing as well. So how much? How I'm assuming you're going with it, aren't you? Uh, in terms of helping them set it up on the other side. Oh yeah, you just try to stop me. I mean, I, I can't <laughs> wait to have this thing and uh, and basically, you know, and, and get the first audience through because that's the whole thing, you know. Also with the Planet in Action applications I built, you build this thing in a small little corner of the internet and at some point you're going to go release and then, you know, the big satisfaction is to get the feedback and get people to enjoy the things you create and I'm certainly going to be standing around for at least a day, you know, watching people uh, enjoying this exhibit, that's for sure. No, awesome. Andrew, it looks like you have a question. Uh... Yeah, how, what does it take to build new content? So you have these preset... Uh eight slideshows to start them off with if they want to add something new or if a different museum wants to build something and tailor the content to themselves what kind of time frame is it is it to build a new presentation with the sound and everything yeah that would really depend on how grand you want to make it uh, for example there's nothing stopping the customer creating their own content uh, they will get all the tools and and, uh, and information to produce their own content but realistically uh, they won't be able to create content much beyond panoramic photos and showing pieces of video across this big canvas. Um, if you want to go the whole hog to have surround 3D renderings like the Google Earth stuff or um, when you want custom created low frequency waves to make the floor do its right thing, uh, you'd really have to come to me uh, to create that content. Um, I will be looking at working with other content providers because after all, I'm a techie and you know, maybe not as much of an artist as many other people are. Um, I might get, uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the guys in Wellington, Michael uh, Jackson, Peter Jackson, uh, you know, the guy from, um, from Lord of the Rings, maybe these guys would like to have a go at it, and I'm sure they can produce better stuff. Oh. Yeah, no, we're still good. I thought I'd do it myself. Oh, uh, you're still good. I would have let you know. <laughs> um, so, all right, well, that's great. Uh, so you, they kind of move things forward a little bit. Do you have some things to show on the desktop as well? Yeah, I do, and that sort of connects with the content. You can go and switch over to that while I walk to my desk. Okay. I suppose um, uh, you switched over to my desk now? You're good to go. We can hear you just fine. Okay, that's great. So, uh, yeah, so this is basically my, uh, my workplace. I've got, um, I spoil myself with nice big screens and bits and pieces like that. Um, so particularly when we go back to the geo stuff, because really that's where most of you guys would be interested in. Uh, this is all about creating content um, 
to move the camera around in, in various ways and how do you go about creating um, video footage that will actually join up properly on the on the edges you know to display it on the on the nine screens and uh, you know that's really where all the special software comes in and that's why I said that's where customers need to come to me because it's proprietary software that I developed and it's not available out there and that's the kind of code that's required to create this kind of content um, so, so what I've got here, for example, is um, one of the little things I wanted to show you is, um, is a tour build that I'm currently working on um, because even though I got a GE Explorer that I mentioned earlier to control the camera through space, um, I, when I do that, it is like a live recording. I've got special software that will record the actions I do as I navigate my 3D Explorer interface. Um, but if I need to make a change, I have to redo the entire recording. And the other problem I was having is uh, the idea is that we perfectly match Google Earth footage that you can see on the screen with panoramic images, and we want to be able to cross-fade between the two and have everything matching. So a mountain in Google Earth is where the mountain is on the panoramic photo. So to be able to do that, I need to be able to very accurately control where the camera starts and where it stops. And the Explorer doesn't do that, so that's why I had to design a new program. Um, I'll just uh, just switch over to the program and let you sh show you a little bit of uh, what it can do. Um, so, if it's correct at the moment, you should see the, uh, you should see the, the splines and the, the, the Google Earth image here. Yep, your screen sharing just fine. Okay, great. So one of the things I've finally done, something uh, Google has been asking uh, about a long time, so hey Paul, why don't you start working with splines in Google Earth? And you know, until now I hadn't a real need for it. So I finally created the splines and promptly I heard from the developer, he was very excited, somebody finally started working with that. So what I've got at the moment is I've got a tour generator where I can specify a bunch of views and once I've got my view set up, for example, I like this view, for example. Uh, I can click on the Add View button, and the program will decide, OK, this view is added to my sequence of camera animations. So if I just zoom back out again, you'll see that it just created a new point here. And you can see that the camera has to drop quite a bit to be able to get to that point. But it will do that following a spline. So if I zoom out a little bit more, you can see how the camera first was climbing up to a view where I was going to look at the sky tower. That would have been this view. And I'll, and let, the audience, I'll let the audience know real quick. I can guarantee you going through messing with Google Earth that this is a lot faster. The bandwidth is just uh, kind of lagging where it looks a lot slower than it is. So it's jumping around, but it's, it's definitely a lot faster uh, on your side. Um, it's probably a lot smoother on your side, isn't it, Paul? Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's silky smooth, actually. Um, I keep forgetting that you're not seeing what I see. Um, but, but anyway, you're able to specify a series of views. Um, the program will then plot a spline through all these points, and not only through the location, like latitude, longitude, altitude, but it will also plot a spline through the tilt angle, uh, the heading, and uh, there will also be a spline that controls the speed of the camera as well. Um, so the idea is that once I've got this tour, I can go in and I can tinker with it. I can make a slight adjustment here and a slight adjustment there and keep working until I've got the perfect tour. Um, once I've done that, I can go and click on a button to generate KML. I'll just move it out of the way. And, you know, you probably can't read it, but, but basically here there's a big chunk of KML that I can simply copy and paste into Google Earth Desktop and the whole thing will uh, will be played back. Now, the cool thing about this is I'm actually not generating KML. Instead, I'll be uh, generating a project data, which looks a lot different, uh, because I have another program uh, which will take this this KML-like data, but slightly different. And what this other program does, it takes this information. I can tell it, okay, now generate me KML tours for each of my nine screens. And so, what the software will do, it will spit out all of this data, and I can feed all of that KML data into Google Earth Pro, leave Google Earth Pro running for a whole night, and it will basically be rendering all these videos of all these tours, and um, so I end up with a massive video file. 
And once that's all uh, all done, then then I actually end up uh, working with uh, proprietary software from Adobe. You know, you're a, a Adobe Premiere in this case, where I create a, a video frame which is 9,720 pixels wide and 1,920 pixels high, which is massive. And I'll be I'll be pulling in all of these videos into that video frame and arranging them where I want to. And at that point, it becomes pure Adobe After Effects, all those kinds of tools to create the final content. So you can do really spectacular things with titling and with effects. Um, I can put uh, you know uh, green screen recordings of actors on the top of things. Uh, you know, basically um, anything you can do with um, with uh, with Google Earth and uh, with um, with Adobe Premiere can be done for this exhibit. So, so once I get out of the realm of generating the video in Google Earth, um, you know, sky is the limit, really. And just to clarify for your uh, the tour software right there, that is that is stuff you've developed yourself, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, at the moment, it's, it's um, proprietary. I might at some point I might release it on Planet in Action. But the problem is, you know, at the moment I have to be uh, careful with the time I'm spending on tools, and it's very easy to build an internal tool that I understand how to use, and I don't have to worry about where the buttons are placed or how it's all working. All I need is the output. Um, but it probably takes twice the time to produce something that you can actually publish. Well, I know the tour software alone is uh, this is what you got for a quick generate KML, etc. Uh, man, that, I know. I was, have you got a lot of interest directly for that alone? Because uh, I almost see the software alone, besides, uh, you know, would have a lot of marketability. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think it's got some potential. Uh, the thing is, I have been involved uh, in a project. Uh, I've been working with Google uh, a year and a half ago, and I traveled over to Mountain View for a bit. Uh, and I was working on the Google Earth Studio software. I don't know if you're familiar with the product. Uh, Google Earth Studio is essentially a program that is used by the big networks like CNN, uh, where where they use Google Earth in their news footage, and um, it's it's like an auditing application to create. Google Earth tours and presentations um, to show newsworthy items inside Google. Um, so I was actually talking to the developer yesterday, and uh, you know, and he was the guy. Said, "Oh, finally, you've done splines because we really needed those things." So I don't know. They, they might decide to come to me and say, "Okay, we want you to build this thing, or can we have the code?" Or I'll, I don't know. We'll see how it all pans out. No, that's awesome. <laughs> so I actually might hit a couple people over here and just ping you about the software alone. So that's uh, that's pretty incredible. Um, Andrew, do you have any other questions, or, or Paul, do you have anything else that you want to show? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, the problem is the things I want to show uh, is so limited, and uh, you would get bored with me clicking away, fumbling away. With things. So it probably wouldn't be well. Um, well, what can happen is if you feel like you have a lot more content, uh, we can schedule another session to uh, go into detail about other topics, if that's okay. Uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, I've got a, a lot of fun projects. Uh, this is only one of them because I'm actually not even spending a lot of time on this project. There are other big projects. Thank you. We're, we're losing your audio. <laughs> yeah, your audio is kind of logging out there. Uh, you didn't mute it. You might just be away from the mic. Okay. Yeah, I can actually hear the funny stuff. There you go. All right. But it must, it must have to play with this technology to um, use my own. It was weird again. And uh, to use the video stream as well. Works okay, I think. Okay. Uh, here, how about uh, click the screen share button again and uh, let's have another look at you. Andrea, do you have any uh, last comments for him? Yes. Uh, the only question I have left is uh, so when can we expect a home model of this? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm sitting in front of it, basically. I mean, you know, uh, these three screens could be exactly that, uh, to be your home model. I've actually been trying to get in touch with a number of people that have the kind of money that they would actually put this thing in their home theater. Um, I'm, hoping, uh, I'm hoping to get through to them. They're usually not that easy to, be, uh, to get in touch with. 
but uh, I know one person that has an awful lot of money that would love to do his racing games on this particular exhibit, and he does live in Auckland. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ultimate Gaming Machine right there. That is exactly yes, what yes. I was thinking. Well, I, I, I must say, I to try at least three of those screens for a good um, And I actually like to look it up that way, but I've got this. Um, I'll make sure I'm... Paul, you're really choppy. Yeah, uh, also, if you want to... Unless you have something to show, if you want to take off screen share, too. Okay, I take off screen share. Okay, I've got an internal plugin, so I'm not sure if I'm... Okay. Okay, this is... Is this what you want me to do? Uh, well, I don't see anything. I, I still see the uh, desktop. <laughs> I don't see you at all. Okay. Something broke. I, I can't tell share a thing anymore. But what I can do is put my uh, camera on my. Okay. Um. All right. Well, that's good. Actually, we're gonna wrap things up just uh, for the sake of time. But at the same time, we'd like to have you on again. Uh, to talk more in details about the different uh, software that uh, you have. Um, but all, all together, uh, this is an amazing product, uh, especially the tour that you have there, the screens. I know everybody in the museum will love it, that's for sure. Uh, I can't wait to see what, uh, what you have, what, what comes out in the future with this and uh, what type of interest you gain, especially in the States, if, if, uh, if there's any that come up. So... Um, other than the current museum right now, do you have do you right now have any museums interested in pulling this in? Uh, yes, yes, I do. I'm on the uh, main screen of the exhibit at the moment. Uh, I have a friend here, uh, here in Wellington who put a nice big exhibit and also around New Zealand, um, and they're very keen to uh, talk more about this exhibit and check it out. And uh, hopefully through them, I'll be able to access uh, more of a market. Okay, so those are all local to you in your area? That's right. Okay, mm -hmm. so far Sweden, then New Zealand, and next the world? <laughs> if I just knew how. You see, I'm one of those people, as, as many other uh, techno uh, technology uh, geeks, if you like, uh, very good at creating stuff and not terribly good at marketing them. So I'm hoping through this marketing company in Wellington uh, to get access to the Asian markets, uh, so it would end up in Singapore and China. Uh, but in addition to that, I'd be looking at, uh, I'm very keen to get in contact with companies in the US and in various other parts of the world and start talking about how they could use this exhibit to, um, you know, to, to do product promotion or, or, or tourist promotion or, or anything like that. Um, well, I'm talking with, to tourism. With that said, and, uh, Paul, how, how much would this? Uh, how much would something like this cost? How much would you charge people? Kind of a rough estimate. Uh, it's not that expensive, but it's probably because I've been really going out overboard trying to keep the screens within budget. Uh, but um, to give you an idea, this ex entire exhibit, uh, complete with content, shipping, me having to fly over, install this thing in Sweden, uh, is costing 120,000 New Zealand dollars, which is roughly. Uh, about ninety thousand US. Oh wow! Well, I said well, you know I'll, I'll give you this. Um, you provide a lot more screens, and it's a lot cheaper than uh, Touch Table. <laughs> uh, not to bring them into the mix, but Touch Table Inc. Uh, provides around the same price line, but they don't provide as many screens as you do, and as far as interactive experience, so. Well, the cool thing with this concept is uh, there is actually no real limit to the number of screens. But I do have a limit to the resolution. Uh, the maximum resolution I can handle using this method of production is uh, 10,000 pixels across. So with 9,720 pixels, I'm pretty much pushing the limit of, of, of what can be done. But we can have more screens and bigger screens. Um, I'm thinking about, um, you know, if I would have a chance to build another exhibit, I would love to do one with two 4K projectors and have a nice curved screen that I'm projecting on rather than the separate displays. Well, that um, was so something I was going to ask about. And then it, it would just be the single panel curve. That's, yeah. 
But, but it's not that simple, because the moment you start projecting on a curved screen, you're going to have to pre-distort the image to be able to actually align things and get everything in the right location. Um, so it's the pre-distortion phase where things get very, uh, very interesting. But because of the production method I'm using with Adobe software, I can actually pre-distort using a, uh, After Effects in Adobe, and I can, I can sort everything out at that stage in post-production. Okay, great. Uh, so, well, we appreciate having you on once again, Paul, and in showing us in detail of uh, what you have there. Um, if you can do me a favor, just uh, send a couple screenshots. I know you got a couple on the Google Earth blog, uh, blog but uh, stuff that we can send out in addition to the video here that's going to be on YouTube. Uh, and uh, I'll keep your contact information on hand because, like you said, if you want to be interested in U.S. companies, I think I know a couple that might be interested in your product as well that we'll put out there too. So uh, this is an awesome, <laughs> this is an awesome experience, and I, I wish I can uh, be in there firsthand. Just uh, the sound system, the, the the visuals, and going through the tour uh, myself that would that would be a great thing. So. Um, and yeah, this is once again appreciate you having on. And uh, stay tuned. I'm gonna end the broadcast here pretty soon. Um, and this is uh, Paul Paul Van Dinter out of uh, once uh, New Zealand. And uh, <laughs> and this is is product A tour. So I'm Adam Simmons and Andrea Carolla from Project Geo. Uh, thanks for joining us for this special. And uh, hope you'll watch, learn about it, ask questions about Paul. And uh, we'll forward it to him uh, if you comment on our event invite or our posts. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Cheers. Bye.